Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 118 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Alexis Chesney, and the topic of the show is preventing Lyme. Dr. Alexis Chesney is a naturopathic physician and acupuncturist specializing in Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. Originally from New York, Dr. Chesney received a BA from Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. She earned a master's in science in acupuncture from the University of Bridgeport Acupuncture Institute and a doctorate in naturopathic medicine from the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine in Connecticut. She is one of the first naturopathic students to complete a hospital-based medical rotation. With five of her colleagues from across the nation, she founded the Naturopathic Medical Student Association, which is a recipient of the AANP President's Award. Naturopathic residency brought her to Vermont, where she's continued to work with a team of integrative practitioners at Sojourns Community Health Clinic in Westminster. She also has a private practice in Northampton, Massachusetts, and has dedicated both of her practices to the treatment of Lyme and tick-borne diseases. She is a member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, Vermont Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, and a founding full member of the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. Dr. Chesney serves on the board of directors and as the Naturopathic Medicine Committee Chair for ILADS. She's been featured as an expert on tick-borne illness at an ILADS conference, at other professional and patient-focused conferences, on local talk radio, and in various news publications. And now my interview with Dr. Alexis Chesney. As most of our listeners know, my own health journey was significantly impacted by Lyme disease after a tick bite over 20 years ago. So many people's lives are impacted by Lyme disease, and our guest today has authored a new book on preventing Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. If our talk today can help even one person to avoid acquiring Lyme disease, that would be a beautiful thing. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Chesney. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little about how you became interested in Lyme disease. Did you have some type of personal experience that led you to doing the work you're doing today? Well, in naturopathic medical school, a friend of mine uh, came down with um, what we didn't know was Lyme at the time. And so um, being very close and um, seeing each other studying, I would I would see this sort of uh, downturn that she took, um, both physically, very bizarre symptoms like the neuralgias, the nerve pains that happen to people, pains that would come and go, um, things that just didn't really make sense. One day would be okay, the next day would not. And so I actually took her to a a Lyme literate doctor, someone in the clinic suggested this, and she got the IgenX test done, it was positive, she received treatment and did very well. So, um, you know, just seeing that and being in medical school at the time and then thinking about it more medically as well as having that personal um, relationship uh, really got me thinking about, wow, this is so uh, interesting and different than other diseases. Why does the incidence of Lyme disease seem to be continuing to rise? Is it that testing is getting better? Is it that ticks are more prevalent or more multiply infected or maybe a combination of several of these things? I think a combination of that, Scott, definitely. Um, I moved up to Vermont about 10 plus years ago, just 10 to 11 years ago. And unfortunately, we hear this a lot, but being from New York and then being in school in Connecticut and Massachusetts, um, you know, I've worked my way up north and and so has Lyme. So people were saying, oh, there's no Lyme here. There are no ticks here. And I think um, the warming of the climate has certainly um, had its effect on tick survival. Uh, you know, they're, they're not dying off of the winters up here anymore. So I think Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine ha- have been really hard hit in recent years. And we're seeing that all over the spread. There's bird migration, there's um, the warming climate, you know, also that ticks can carry more than one 
species of Borrelia or other tick-borne diseases. All these are factors, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about ticks. Would we think of a tick as a parasite? And then for people that aren't familiar with the word vector, what do we mean when we say vector in reference to a tick? Right. So a vector-borne illness like Lyme disease um, means that a vector like a tick can carry a pathogen like Borrelia burgdorferi um, that it has gotten from a reservoir, which should be something like a mouse uh, or another animal. But for instance, say a mouse is where uh, a tick can first get infected. And then it could carry that and transmit it to a human, for instance, when it bites a human and transmits it. Um, so that's the idea of vector and vector borne illnesses. And would you consider a tick to be a parasite? Yeah, so it requires three blood meals in order to then, well, female uh, tick requires three b- blood meals to then be able to lay eggs and hatch out that next generation. So if they do not find a host, they are not going to survive. They need that blood meal from a host. So they're dependent on that. There's such a focus on ticks. We talk about tick-borne diseases, but other biting or stinging insects potentially carry these organisms, potentially transmit Borrelia and co-infections. What are your thoughts on people acquiring Lyme disease, maybe from a, a vector other than a tick bite? I think it's possible. I don't have a lot of background in this issue, but there's certainly research out there showing that other insects can carry Borrelia. Um, I do not think at this time we have anything proving that it can then transmit to humans. Um, I could be wrong about that, but last time I looked into it, um, which is because patients have asked me this. I think it's a great question, and I think we need more research in this area. It's certainly very hard to avoid tick bites, but I think it's even harder in some areas to avoid mosquito bites or other insects coming into contact with them. So that would be really important knowledge to have. And what are your thoughts about potential for congenital transmission of Lyme and co-infections? Yes, I think that definitely can happen. So yes, uh, I've done some phone consults with um, Charles Ray Jones, and he's a pediatrician that treats Lyme. So um, You know, learning from him, 50% of those who are not treated can transmit Lyme to uh, the fetus. And so I've worked with a lot of pregnant women and um, we do the cord blood testing and they've all come back negative, thank goodness. But I've also met people that have not been diagnosed until um, they've already had children. And sometimes we see certain symptoms in the children and we may test them. We may do a you know clinical look at the symptoms and do a trial treatment with the, with the child, and it looks like they have Lyme too. So I think I see that um, even if we can't prove it all the time with lab, you know, at the, with lab testing at the time of of the pregnancy. In your experience, how common is it that someone gets a tick bite and acquires only Borrelia? So if we're thinking from a co-infection perspective, are they the rule? Are they the exception? And then are there some tick bites that carry only co-infections, but no Borrelias? Yeah, so there was an interesting study um, in 2019 out of Connecticut looking at deer ticks and how many different pathogens they carry. Um, So 56% um, had Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, 10% had anaplasma, and you know you can certainly read about the details. But you know there were so many pathogens found in these ticks, and uh, about 10% of them had two uh, two different pathogens at, at the same time. And so we, and then there were even some that had three pathogens at once. So you know we know these ticks are, are definitely carrying uh, multiple pathogens. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think about, yeah, is it another tick bite someone had that they didn't notice? Um, did they have travel to areas where there are other types of ticks? I'm in the Northeast, so I deal with a lot of deer tick bites. Um, but some people have traveled to other areas of the country, of the world. And of course, you could, you could be infected by uh, other transmission of other pathogens from different ticks. It's interesting to hear that number 56% because I know years ago, studies would suggest maybe 1%, 2% of ticks that were tested carried these types of um, Lyme associated pathogens. And so maybe the testing is getting better. Maybe there's just more prevalence in ticks themselves. But I mean, that's shocking to hear that, uh, you know, more than one out of two of the ticks tested had Borrelia in them. Um, Mm -hmm. People often say that Lyme can only be acquired from the bite of a deer tick. You just referenced a deer tick. At the other 
end of the spectrum, some suggest that any tick can carry Lyme or Lyme-associated pathogens. So what's the reality? What do you think is happening here? Um, Well, it was really interesting writing this book. I didn't know much about the Gulf Coast tick, for instance. Um, Even the Lone Star tick, we don't have those at this point. Uh, At least no one's brought them into my office or spotted a Lone Star tick, but they're making their way up to Vermont and the Northeast. Um, So, you know, I think all of these ticks actually carry different pathogens. So for Lyme disease, uh, the Borrelia burgdorferi, it's it's really the Ixodes scapularis, which is the deer tick, the black-legged tick, and then the Western black-legged tick. Um, But that covers basically almost the entire United States and provinces of Canada. So um, that's the big one. But, you know, even those ticks carry anaplasma, babesia. Um, They discovered not not too long ago in the north central states in Minnesota and in that area that um, the deer ticks are carrying a a type of Ehrlichia, Ehrlichia morris-like pathogen. Um, so, so really, the, the deer ticks do carry, can carry many things. And as we're seeing recent research, more and more often that's the case. But then there are all these other ticks. And the Lone Star tick um, carries, well, they don't know <laughs> what, what uh, it carries that causes star eye. Um, so that's um, really a point of interest. And I look forward to seeing more research because I feel like there's probably an epidemic of this Lyme like illness called star eye, but there's no data, um, you know, going through right in my book, I was looking at maps, you know, trying to help people find tick ranges and also, um, the areas in which these diseases are found. And there's no data on star eye because there's, um, a debate going on about, well, what kind of pathogen is this? And, um, it was pretty confusing actually to read about that. Um, some have called it Borrelia lone star eye, but then, um, this is not readily, um, discussed. There are no tests for it. So um, I wonder if there is going to be a lot coming in the future about that. I, I learned a new word reading your book, and that was sputum, which I didn't know <laughs> before this. So talk to us about what is a tick sputum and how does that potentially help identify the type of tick that bit us? And then from a transmission of disease perspective, is there a difference between hard ticks and soft ticks in terms of their potential to cause human disease? Right. So the sputum or the dorsal shield is the area of the tick where um, it really helps us identify a tick, basically. So it's a nice tool to be able to, you know, it's kind of its torso, (laughs) its upper body, um, and it doesn't change during the blood meal. um, Because some people um, identify, you know, it's pretty easy to find an adult deer tick because um, they're a little bit reddish tan in their body, but that changes once they've had a blood meal or partial blood meal. So if somebody were to remove that from their body, that part, if it's no longer this tannish red um, that's getting our attention, uh, they might have uh, trouble identifying it. So we really want to look at that dorsal shield or the scutum in order to. Um, like for instance, the, the black legged tick, the deer tick, um, is just a black circle, you know, really dark circle, solid color, um, ticks up here that we have that people could bring in would be, um, the wood tick or the dog tick. And that one has a very different dorsal shield, as many of them do. And so that one is very modeled. It is larger. It is, uh, a little harder. Um, but if you compare those, those two, um, scutums, you can really, um, which you you may need to get a magnifying glass to do, but you could really tell the difference that way, no matter where they are in their blood meal process or not. And then is there a difference in terms of transmission of disease in terms of hard versus soft uh, ticks? So the soft ticks are so interesting. Um, Really, it's incidental that humans um, get infected through uh, a soft tick um, because it's such a, it's unfortunately, it's such a quick um, nighttime feeding that happens. Uh, and usually it's in places like caves or cabins, um, you know, structures that are in certain areas of the United States where they have these soft ticks. Um, and so you might be somebody who is either working outdoors, um, who is um, camping, who's hi- you know, a hiker in the back country or caving, you know, these very particular types of landscapes. Um, and then usually they feed on mice or, or some kind of small animal 
quickly overnight. So with that type of a, a, a tick bite, um, you may not even feel it at all. You know, they're not going to attach. They don't attach for a period of time like a hard tick that attaches generally, you know, three to five days. Do they, do they detach sometimes sooner than that? Yes. Um, about 10% of hard ticks actually detach in about 10% of them attach much sooner than that, which is interesting because then when they go for another feed, um, the process of transmission might be hurried along. But anyway, the, the soft ticks can car carry a different Borrelia that cause tick-borne relapsing disease. And so um, uh, it's bor different Borrelia, Borrelia hermsi, Borrelia turci. Um, these are all named after the Ornithodoros soft tick um, that is carrying them. And um, basically it's a Lyme-like illness, but usually there's this fever that comes and goes, this undulating fever, um, and that's a hallmark sign of it. But it would be also treated similarly, similarly to Lyme, as Lyme is Borrelia as well. Talk to us about the times of year that we need to be more aware, or have heightened awareness of the potential for tick bites. Are there times where we don't really need to be concerned versus those where we really should be watching out? Well, it's really all based on temperature. So um, above 28 degrees Fahrenheit is when ticks are active. And, um, you know, we had a very mild winter here. Um, so people did get tick bites during the winter in February. March. Um, often people think that, oh, you know, somewhere around May to somewhere around October, you know, th that's the, the main time for tick bites, but it really depends on the temperature and where you're located. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's more about the temperature and thinking about your outdoor activities and, and being safe, uh, no matter what month it is, you know. So where I am in Northern California, where it never gets below 28 degrees, it sounds like it's pretty much any time you need to be concerned, exactly. right? Exactly. Yes. Talk to us a little about the life cycle of Borrelia in terms of ticks and deer and the white-footed mouse and humans. And then does Borrelia cause illness in non-human hosts? Um, so looking at the life cycle, it's a two-year life cycle of, of the tick. And um, so usually the tick will feed on a small animal. Um, so first they're, they're hatched out from eggs, usually in some place like leaf litter, and then they bec they're larvae at that point. And so they're looking for, they're not going to go far, right? They, <laughs> they're, they're babies. They're not crawling up a piece of grass at this point. So they're just going to hang out and wait for somebody to come really close to them, like a white-footed mouse. <laughs> So that's usually where they first get infected with Borrelia. Um, and then, so in the tick, they, they're going to then, um, you know, have that blood meal. Um, the tick is going to have the blood meal, digest that. Borrelia is there. And then it will go um, out seeking another meal at some point as a nymph. And um, a little more energy might go a little farther, right? So they might get another small animal or a dog or they, even a human at that point. And um, at that point, they could transmit Borrelia. Um, they could also absorb, you know, whatever pathogens are in whatever that host is that they're feeding on. Um, and then they become adults, and the adult male does not need to feed. Um, and then the uh, adult female does in order to um, then lay those eggs, and the cycle moves on. And, and would you say that Borrelia can cause illness in these other hosts as well? So, I mean, do we have white-footed mice that have trouble with their feet, for example? <laughs> or what, what happens to them when they're carrying these Borrelias? I know, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, we know that dogs and horses definitely get sick and exhibit symptoms. Um, I, I don't know if the white-footed mice um, exhibit any, any symptoms. I saw a study somewhere through my research that it was something like this very, very low number where um, they decided that there was a fatality due to, to Borrelia. Um, so it does not seem likely that there Lots affected. of deer running around with anxiety and depression <laughs> from Borrelia. <laughs> what are some of the mechanisms that Borrelia has acquired that allow it to evade our immune system and then to persist long-term in a human host? Yeah, so it's really interesting. They're so um, 
they're just so smart and they've got all these mechanisms, these OSPs, these uh, outer surface proteins. Um, and, and so depending on the environment um, the, the Borrelia is in, um, it will express these different proteins on its surface, right? So first it's in the midgut of the tick and it's expressing OSPA and it binds to this trospa, this, this uh, binder, you know, it binds to this place on the, on the mid, midgut of the tick. And then, okay, maybe there's um, some change. There's a feeding going on. So the tick is attached to a host and that Borrelia is noticing this different temperature, maybe change in pH. And then it's going to be moving toward um, the salivary glands and the OSP C uh, will be expressed at that point. It's really interesting how it changes and adapts, um, all because it, it's moving toward that host. It wants to then um, proliferate out and uh, it, it can change forms. Uh, the Borrelia we know um, can change into the round, round form or cyst form. Um, you know, it, it creates these little blebs that also spread the, the genetics of the Borrelia. Um, so, you know, they're doing everything they can <laughs> in all these creative ways to move through our body. They adapt when they go into the joints, um, into the brain. Uh, it's really, it's really amazing. Is there a difference between a Borrelia cyst and what we now call a persister form, or is that just a new word for what we've been talking about for many years? Um, I think, you know, scientifically, the persister form is, is just meaning they're still finding, despite some antibiotic treatment, they're still finding the Borrelia there, right? Um, and then the question of, well, why is the Borrelia is still there is um, regarding, okay, they make biofilm, which is this shell that they create around themselves to hide out in that way in little communities and all the research around that and how complex these communities are. Um, and that they can change into the round form when antibiotics come their way. They change from that spirochete form into that round form or cyst. Um, so they're doing all these, all these different things, right? They're changing their genetics. They're changing their protein um, on the surface. Um, all of these ways that they're adapting and therefore persisting. And we thought we were the smarter ones. <laughs> <laughs> right. They've been here a lot longer. <laughs> uh, many people say that if you don't see a bullseye rash, particularly conventional medicine, if you don't see an EM or erythema migrans rash, that you don't have Lyme disease. So in your practice, how often would you say that someone with confirmed Lyme disease actually saw a bullseye or erythema migrans rash? Not that often. Definitely less than 50%, um, probably less than that. I do see a lot of new cases and I'm, I'm, you know, in a way it's, it's great when the erythema migrans happens because then we know it's, it's there and that we can treat Lyme. Um, so I do, ha I, I treat a lot of folks that have chronic illness, but then I do see people with acute illness. So I think those are the people more so, you know, that might um, change my statistics and, and showing that I do see people with bullseye rashes, but, um, or, Lyme, Lyme rashes that may not be perfect bullseyes, which is really important to note. But um, my chronic cases, uh, more often than not, definitely um, people don't remember rashes. Yeah. One of the really cool things that you do in the book is look at many different types of ticks geographically and then the potential pathogens they carry. I mean, I've seen lots of books on Lyme disease, but this is really um, interesting the way that you looked at it and really helpful for people to consider where they live and what are some of the potential pathogens they could be exposed to if they have a tick bite in a certain area. So tell us a little bit about this and then how did you compile all of that information? Was it from tick testing or was it from lab positive cases of people with Lyme disease and co-infections? Thank you. Yeah, I really want people to really stop getting Lyme disease. I've had so many patients that, um, you know, they've gotten to the point where they're feeling well, that maybe they were chronically ill and they're doing well. And, and then unfortunately, they get a tick bite. So that's what really put me on this journey because my handout to people would get longer and longer, you know, please, you know, take these measures, these prevent preventative measures in order not to get a tick bite again, in order not to get Lyme again, et cetera. So um, I really wanted people to 
uh, get as much knowledge as they can throughout the country and um, Canada uh, because there are so many different ticks. And so I was looking mostly at PubMed, you know, Medline, database, um, and you know, first starting with the CDC information, but then s some of that is pretty outdated. You know, I wanted to get as up to date as I could. And then as we're speaking, you know, this is becoming outdated as well. So I wanted to, to be as updated as possible. So, um, you know, and create a, a map regarding tick range. Um, you know, where could I find this tick? We don't necessarily know. I, we can't claim that we know those ticks have pathogens or not. But just so people are aware of how widespread these ticks are and, you know, in their backyard or when they go on vacation, what they should be looking for so that they're prepared. In doing this analysis, how different are the exposure potentials geographically to different pathogens? Do we find over time, let's say that the soup of microbes in nature's dirty needle becomes more homogenous? Um, I'm thinking back years ago where we used to talk about Babesia WA1, for example, or Babesia duncani, which was more of a Washington State, California, West Coast kind of thing. And now we see it pretty much anywhere in the U.S. And so um, how different are the pathogens we might encounter geographically in your experience? Well, certainly, be certainly because the deer tick and the Western deer tick or the black-legged ticks um, are so widespread and they transmit Lyme, uh, I think that's the biggest problem, right? Um, so, you know, when you get into areas where you see that there's more ticks than that, that there are many different ticks like down south um, or, you know, in the, in the Midwest, sort of the Rocky Mountain area, um, that then you, you have the potential to, to have um, this transmittance of more than one pathogen many different pathogens if you've had a collection of different tick bites and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think there are pockets where you might see certainly, and we do see more of one tick type of tick-borne illness than another, but more and more, you know, even after Lyme, I mean, you know, Babesia, Babesiosis and Bartonellosis, which is another story, um, you know, there's just so common now in my practice. So I think it's a good question, you know, where are we in our clinical experience versus where the research is. You mentioned in the book that in some areas, more than half the ticks, you mentioned 56% in one study carried Borrelia. Do we think then, let's say we've been exposed to a tick bite, do we think that more often than not, people do acquire these infections, even if they don't end up with a disease process? And is it possible that there's more healthy people walking around carrying these microbes than unhealthy people? Oh, I think so. Um, I've had people who are asymptomatic who really wanted to get a Lyme test because their entire family has had Lyme and they may come up positive and be asymptomatic. We may do a trial of treatment. Sometimes we may find some symptoms. Uh, like one of my approaches is to do a certain type of treatment to uh, elucidate whether there might be a Herx reaction, uh, you know, kind of bringing out symptoms. And so we can use that type of a strategy to assess for whether or not someone has Lyme disease. Um, and I've had plenty of people, um, you know, not have any symptoms. So we think, okay, well, what does this test mean? Uh, most of the antibodies tests mean that at some point you were exposed. They don't tell us if you have it right now anyway. Um, if we finally get that culture test back, <laughs> then we can do that, which would be great. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, with that information, then it's saying, it's it's just looking at symptoms and trying to decipher whether or not they currently have it. And I have had, you know, it's not the most common uh, part of my practice, but I've had cases like that. It's, it is interesting. So I think, you know, who hasn't been exposed? <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll get that culture back soon. My understanding is that Igenix is working on it and that it should be available sometime in the near future. I don't know how near, but um, I, I do think that that's a, a work in progress. One of the hot topics in Lyme disease circles more recently is the impact of tick-borne relapsing fever Borrelias that can cause diseases similar to Lyme disease, but can be entirely missed by most labs that are looking for traditional Lyme, Borrelia burgdorferi, for example. So how important are these non-Lyme Borrelias in terms of people's clinical presentations? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the regular test, especially if you were to just get an ELISA at a hospital lab is not going to pick up 
those Borrelia. Um, I do use the IgenX testing for that. Um, I think looking at symptoms as usual, you know, tell us so much. And so if it's suspected, I might treat. And if, if one is treating for Lyme or suspecting Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever, it, it's basically the same treatment. So that's helpful. Um, and, and looking at, um, well, so the one thing is that Borrelia myomotoi is a tick-borne relapsing fever. So that one kind of <laughs> throws it off a little bit because that one is transmitted by a hard tick versus the others are transmitted by soft ticks, um, where at least at this point, you know, I think about what we discussed earlier in location. But for Borrelia myomotoi, um, which is in the Northeast and, and out near you as well, um, you know, that's going to be difficult to determine, is this Lyme, which is one type of Borrelia versus this other. And at the end of the day, I feel like the treatment in my perspective is going to be the same. And it's interesting, even with the Igenix immunoblot, um, there are two different tests, right? There's the more traditional Lyme Borrelias, and then there's a relapsing fever Borrelia panel that is separate. And so if practitioners are looking just at the, the immunoblot for more Lyme-associated Borrelias, um, they have to be aware that there is this other relapsing fever Borrelia panel. And my understanding is that the percentages of positives in that relapsing fever immunoblot are, are actually pretty significant. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of it. And sometimes it isn't supported by that travel or something like that. But um, so besides yeah. Borrelia and Bartonella and Babesia, which seem to be fairly universal in Lyme disease, very common, what are some of the co-infections that you see in your patient populations? Where do things like Ehrlichia or Anaplasma or Rickettsia fall in your clinical practice? Uh, well, I see those. I, I feel like viruses. I mean, viruses seem to be the most common after the pathogens you've named. Um, so I'm, I'm usually thinking about that. I'm often asking about history of mononucleosis. Um, testing for that isn't that helpful, but can at least support a picture of it. Um, I've had some people with acute, um, you know, IgM, certain testing results that led me to feel that there was an acute uh, Epstein-Barr virus, for instance. And, um, you know, we do herbal treatments for that and see that people do respond to that, which is helpful. So um, thinking about viruses, I think, is, is really important in general. Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes viruses, and then seeing, you know, how many of these <laughs> might somebody... Um, be carrying around with them. And when your immune system's down, maybe because of Lyme or other co-infections, and you do have perhaps viruses that are dormant, you know, earlier in life, now this comes out. So a lot of times there are so many layers and, you know, we have to go after many different things over time um, as things unfold, you know, and as treatments occur and people get better in certain ways, other things can pop up and we can say, oh, okay, look at that. That's probably more of a viral load and now we need to go after that. So I'd say, you know, in general, that's, um, that's very common. Yeah. And would you say that most of the viruses that you see are acquired from the tick exposure or are they more opportunistic in that the immune system dysregulation and suppression from Lyme and co-infections allows them to re-emerge where the immune system was managing them fine for years or decades prior to that. Right. More opportunistic. Absolutely. Okay. From yeah. that. Yeah. Not tick-borne. In, in one of as your talks, <laughs> I heard you talk about um, Ehrlichia and Anaplasma being fairly common. I think people don't really think about those as much as Spartanella and Babesia, for example. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just share with us a little bit about Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, and then is that also one that tends to persist in the system, or do you believe that, that's, um, that Ehrlichia and Anaplasma are pathogens that we can fully eradicate with appropriate treatments? Usually I see that they're eradicated. Um, you know, I always say, if, if I was, if I was going to have to get a tick-borne disease, I would probably choose anaplasma, which maybe I shouldn't say these things, but um, you know, usually when I hear patient reports back, it's after they've gone to the ER because they have that very high fever, 
104, 105. They feel absolutely horrendous. And they test. It's positive for anaplasmosis. They get treatment and they feel great. And I just, I, you know, I, I don't see that with, with Lyme disease. Um, they may get some treatment. They may feel a little better. They may not. They may feel great, but then they feel worse um, months later. So um, it seems, at least in this area, we have anaplasmosis, not much ehrlichiosis. Um, and I don't really see Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So, um, you know, those all being related, um, it seems like it works. The, the doxycycline seems to work very well. Um, but if you, if the tick had something else, like what I have seen and what I feel has been more Lyme related is when somebody comes back from um, the hospital to see me and uh, they've only been diagnosed with anaplasmosis and then they're telling me about their symptoms and I'm thinking, well, okay, you know, certain things are better, but certain things are not. So I think maybe you have Lyme as well. And there was some treatment that happened, but they're not getting to the round form, the biofilm, et cetera. So we need to do some more treatment. And, um, you know, often I'll, I'll move on to herbal treatments and um, there's not much overlap um, herbally with anaplasmosis and Lyme. So it leads me to believe that it's more of the Lyme. That's the issue at that point um, or something else, you know, if we need to look at other paths. Another topic that you brought up in the book is this idea of alpha gal that people are hearing more and more about um, just in the last couple of years, I would say. So talk to us a little about what ticks potentially lead to alpha gal in humans. Um, share with us what it is for those people who haven't heard of it. And then for those that do have alpha gal, what are the implications? Um, what are the treatment approaches? And is it something that can be resolved? Yeah, so alpha gal syndrome is basically an allergic reaction to a carbohydrate that's transmitted by a lone star tick from its saliva, right? So it's a tick-borne illness, but often I think of tick-borne illnesses as infections. So just to make that clear to people, it's not an infection. It's um, from this carbohydrate carried by the saliva of a tick. So it's a separate issue. You could get all the you know these pathogens from a lone star tick bite, which we've talked about. And then you could also, unfortunately, um, get the alpha gal syndrome. And so it's basically um, this odd, you know, reaction that happens to meat. Um, so mainly beef, pork, lamb, um, people will get hives, anaphylaxis, you know, very clear symptoms, immediate hypersensitivity symptoms. Um, and so uh, basically, you just need to not eat those foods. Um, which can be difficult <laughs> depending on who you are. Um, but that would be the only treatment that we have at this point is the avoidance of the foods, the allergens, you know, that becomes hypersensitive to. Does it improve or lessen over time or is it still too early for us to really know long-term what the outcomes might be? Um, it, it can, it can get better over time as well. Um, I think we need more research in that area. Um, some people have been able to, you know, tolerate some of the foods while others have not, say in a few years after this happens to them. Um, yeah. And alpha gal, um, just for people listening. So alpha gal um, is named after the carbohydrate that you mentioned, which I believe is alpha galactose. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Are there Borrelia species that do not seem to cause any human disease? Sure. There are um, 19 known Borrelia species at this point, and really just four of them uh, cause, can cause Lyme disease. Um, so the others, as far as we know, do not cause any illness in humans. Interesting. Cool. Another really cool feature of the book is that you review the potential microbes with the maps, with symptoms that those microbes can produce. I think you did just such a fantastic job putting it all together. I love at the back, even the pull out card where you can look at the different ticks and, <laughs> and types of ticks and those types of things. In the book, you talk about rickettsia and Bartonella, and those appear to be the only two that are identified in all states in the continental United States. I know Chris Newby, she 
she wrote a book recently called Bitten that talks about rickettsias and this Swiss agent, as she terms it, as potentially playing a very major role in Lyme disease, maybe even more so than Borrelia. And so I'm curious, where do you think rickettsias fit in terms of the Lyme soup that lead to disease? It's a great question. Um, you know, through my research and thinking about this and thinking about star eye, I just really wonder, you know, they still haven't really figured out and agreed upon what is the pathogen. So <laughs> I think that lends us um, to wonder about what you're bringing up, you know, and in the area that we see star eye. Um, so is it rickettsia? You know, that's basically what I was thinking. Is this a Borrelia or is this a rickettsial illness or some kind of hybrid? Who knows? <laughs> you know? yep. um, so that, that was, that was interesting, but um, you know, most of the people that I see, and I think Lyme is, is still um, the top disease, certainly with the statistics we have and my clinical experience and that of colleagues. Um, but I think rickettsia needs a lot of attention as well. In the book, you talk about reduction of the tick populations as one of the key strategies for preventing Lyme disease. So how do we reduce tick populations? What are some of the key strategies that you think people should prioritize in this realm? Um, yeah, well, something I'm passionate about is uh, the tick tubes. <laughs> you probably know about that. Um, so just thinking about that mouse population that we were talking about, um, how ticks first get Borrelia or whatever pathogen from uh, a mouse, most likely. Um, so there was a study done, and it showed that uh, when you use tick tubes, that um, it reduced the tick population by 93%. It's huge. Um, so basically what they are is you can make them yourself or you can buy them. Um, you can save, um, you know, it's a great project with kids <laughs> during the homeschooling times we're in. Um, you can, you know, save your paper towel tubes or your toilet tissue tubes and then um, get some permethrin. That's why um, everybody's buying all the toilet paper. That's it. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking about not getting lime. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you can save your lint from your dryer or you can get cotton or some kind of material like that that will absorb this uh, permethrin. You treat that, you put it in the tubes, and you put the tubes out in mouse habitat and um, – and then the mice can bring that back to their nests and it kills the ticks on the mice. Um, so it's really effective. I've had patients do this and report back from one year to the next saying, wow, this year, you know, we don't even see ticks. And it's, they can't believe it because they were getting tick bites all the time. So it's really effective, great, pretty easy to do. So highly recommend that. Um, and then, um, so other things like thinking about just landscape, you know, some basic things that most people know about how ticks love moisture um, and darkness. So thinking about, um, you know, if you have a yard, the landscape, what you can do in your landscape. So um, trying not to have um, a lot of debris or a lot of, you know, if you have leaves, rake them up and take care of that. If you have wood, um, be really careful, you know, if, with wood stoves, like bringing in wood to the house. Um, and um, thinking about um, just, you know, all these things with your property, basically, and trying to make it a, a tick-free space. Um, One of the other things I learned from the book was the impact of barberry on tick populations. I never realized that there was actually a substance that the ticks liked and then come into your yard because they want this particular plant. Am I yeah. understanding it correctly? Well, they just love, it's a great habitat for the ticks because it's moist. It's really moist under there. And, warm. and so it's funny. There's a map of that I included in the book. It's really not funny, but <laughs> interesting that there's this coincidence um, that the Barbary um, map of the United States is almost identical to the Lyme disease map of the United States. So that really hit me when I was um, researching. The yeah. other thing that you pointed out that resonated with me personally, because my tick exposure actually came from a dog that had gone outside and brought it into the guest bedroom of a home I was staying at mm -hmm. for a work project many years ago. And so you also talk mm -hmm. about how important it is to keep ticks off of pets, right? So that they're not bringing it back into right, the home. Right, right. 
Yeah. yeah so um, pet owners are, are two times as likely to get a tick crawling on them and one and a half times as likely to get a bite. Um, so that's really important to note. Uh, you know, so many of my patients that have had tick bites have dogs, cats, um, as well as just thinking about activities that you do and where you live, you know, and horses. Um, certainly this increases the possibility for tick bites. So thinking about, you know, things you can do, of course, you can talk to your vet and do certain treatments for your pets. And even thinking about something like a permethrin treated um, bandana, you know, around dogs' necks works really well. Um, thinking about using one of those rollers on, on the, the lint rollers on the dog when it comes in, you know, to see if you pick up some, um, you know, a combination. I always encourage people to think about a combination of strategies in order to prevent the bites, right? So there's looking at the landscape. They're, okay, do I have pets? What am I going to do about that? How about tick repellents? Probably talk about that a little bit. You know, how do I treat my person? Make sure to do a tick check, put the clothes in the dryer. So there are all these different steps that we can take and make more of a habit in our everyday lives um, to really cut down the chances of a tick bite. So let's talk about that a little bit. When we go out hiking or spending time in nature, what are the most important considerations to avoid those few hours of fun turning into a lifetime of misery? Yeah, definitely. So thinking about repellents. Um, so of course, there's DEET. You know, if you want an alternative, I like to use cedar side. Uh, cedar essential oil has been shown to repel ticks very well. Um, you do need to apply it more often. So every one to two hours, I recommend that. Um, and then thinking of you know that for your skin, that would be safe for your skin with the cedar side. Um, and then thinking about clothing, um, permethrin, again, like we're, we're using in the tick tubes, we can treat our clothes um, with that, um, treat our shoes um, with that. And basically just to make sure, you know, to be careful with the permethrin, wear gloves if you're treating something because it is toxic to our skin. So that's really important. But once it's dried, it's no longer um, toxic to us. Um, so um, just when you, when you do it, go outside, you know, don't have kids or animals that you care about um, near it and then let it dry. It only takes an hour or so to dry depending on how humid it is. And then that would be safe for use. And if you do it yourself, like I always, I get the shoes out every six weeks. It's every six weeks, put it on the calendar, spray them down, and then you know you're protected in that way. Um, because really the shoes and the socks, that's huge. Um, and um, it actually, you're 73 times less likely to get a tick bite um, if you treat both shoes and socks. So that's huge. So um, you may want to do more than that, but if you think about, you know, walking through grass, sometimes we think, oh, if the grass is short, there are no ticks there, it's okay. Um, that's not true. So um, it makes it less likely for ticks to be there. So all that, like I'm saying, all these things in combination are going to put you in a better place. But, um, you know, walking through grass or, you know, having a shrub rub against your shoe or your, your lower leg, then you'd be protected against that, which is more often where they come, you know, they're, th these ticks are low to the ground. And so they're going to be coming um, looking for somebody, you know, lower to the ground, unless they come in on a dog or something. But <laughs> Another really cool option that you shared in the book as a resource is a, a service where I can send my pants and shoes and socks and actually have them apply an insect shield to them, which seemed like a really cool service. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, it's great. Um, actually, I just had a few things arrive in the mail yesterday. <laughs> so um, you can actually send your own clothing in or a sheet. Like I have my per permethrin sheet that is in the car so that if for some reason I'm somewhere um, planned or unplanned and want to be on the grass, I put it down, have a picnic. Great. You know, so it's great to um, be able to actually just send your clothes or materials um, so that they get treated because it lasts longer. So I was saying before, if you treat your own shoes or clothes, it's only going to last um, six weeks. But uh, Insect Shield, for instance, um, guarantees it lasting 70 washes. Long wow. Time. 
Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, that's yeah, so for people yeah. listening, insectshield.com, mm-hmm. if you're interested in that service, I, I loved it. That I mean, this is just one of so many resources that you packed into this book. So um, people definitely get this is a book you want to have before you get a tick bite so that you know what to do and have all the resources. Let's say we're out and we do get a bite. What then are the next steps? How do we properly remove a tick? And I'm a little embarrassed to say that when I got my tick bite, I um, immediately went and found a match and tried to <laughs> burn it out <laughs> and did the, com- I mean, this was 23 years ago, but you know, You're did completely the wrong thing. <laughs> so if I do see a tick, what should I do? Yeah. Well, um, avoid the match. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and what I love are tick twisters. So, um, it's funny. Somebody brought in one and they thought they had a Otom the tick twister, which is actually from France. Um, that I happened upon that worked really well, but they had an imitation. And so they couldn't get their tick off. And I, I was disappointed thinking, oh, you know, I was, I was really trusting this product. Um, but it, it, it was a different product. And, you know, the, it, it just, the tick went right through um, the tines, you know, like when, so this, this Otom, the tick twisters, sort of this little handle with the sliding device that goes right under the tick. So if that's the tick. It would go right under there. You, you, twist it and it comes right off. And actually it comes off really easily most of the time. Um, so, you know, I kept missing it and missing it. So then I got mine out and it worked. <laughs> the Otom works really well. And tweezers, I mean, in the beginning I used to use tweezers and it's so easy to mangle the body of the tick. And if you're thinking about, um, you know, while the tick is feeding, basically you're trying to get it off. So anything you could do not to agitate it um, like Vaseline or a match or, you know, the tweezers, oh, it's hard. It's taking us a long time to get it off. Um, the tick twister does it really gently and easily. So I highly recommend that. Yeah. Plus that's an option that actually gets the, the head or the stinging yes. pieces out as well. Right. Sometimes with tweezers, it seems like it'll break off and oh, then yeah, you're still usually. stuck with you part of it left in the body. There. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. cool. How do we determine after a tick bite when prophylactic treatment is appropriate to minimize potential longer term consequences? Should we test the tick first or should we start doing some herbal therapies right after a bite, for example? Yeah. So there are a few ways to go. I do recommend the tick testing. Um, tickreport.com is amazing. Um, they're in Amherst, Massachusetts at UMass. Um, and it's really interesting if anyone's interested. Um, they have a whole database. They've been collecting this since 2006, um, collecting tick data from people who have sent them in. So you can actually look that up and see um, where you are and, and look at the area and what ticks are carrying there. Um, but so, so you, there are different tiers of testing. Uh, I think the, well, for a deer tick in this area where I am in the Northeast, um, the first tier is, is just fine. But it all depends on what you're wondering, you know, what ticket is and what pathogens you're wondering about. Um, so that first level is $50. So it tests for all Borrelia species. Um, and then the particular Lyme, Borrelia, Burgdorferi, and Mani, Anaplasma, or Lichia, Babesia. So um, that's really pretty comprehensive. You know, it does not test for Powassan. That would be the next tier, the $100 one. Um, so Powassan virus, I think it's important to know about but um, it is pretty rare. So I think sometimes it becomes a financial decision for people. So if you can test the tick financially, I I would definitely recommend that. Although I've had some people say, well, I saved this one tick, but two weeks ago, you know, I had this, this other tick bite and I didn't save it. So if we're talking about multiple tick bites, just knowing that um, it's only going to give us information about that one that you saved is important to note. Um, If you think you've had other bites, then you know, this information is less relevant, and I would probably um, just go for the prophylaxis or to test it so you know what it was carrying, knowing there are other ticks that you've had that you did not save. This has actually come up a lot lately, <laughs> this month in practice. So, um, yeah, so then starting the prophylaxis would be important. But you can also use what the tick is carrying to guide your treatment. So, if we knew that the tick was just carrying, Lyme, then we might do something more targeted to Lyme. So for instance, the deer tick bite formula or black legged tick bite formula um, would treat all the pathogens that are carried in in that type of tick. Um, But if you know that your tick was only carrying one or two 
of those pathogens, then you could certainly gear that, you know, focus that treatment, which I do with people. So it sort of depends on at least when I meet the person on their journey of um, the, the tick bite, you know, and if they're symptomatic, then we're in a whole different category. Um, so you could always um, start the prophylaxis as well and send the tick out. But the tick takes about three days to get back um, for that company anyway. So, um, you know, three days, I think, uh, early in after a tick bite is not too long to wait if you'd rather find out. Maybe the tick isn't carrying anything. That'd be great. <laughs> so if I live then in an area that has lots of ticks, um, is it potentially wise to use herbs throughout the entire high point of tick season? Or is it better to wait until you think you might have had an exposure? You can also use it that way. Absolutely. So I work with people who are at high risk for tick bites, you know, farmers, loggers, linesmen. Um, I think if you're at high risk, it is something to consider. Um, you can take a deer tick bite formula or whichever tick formula is appropriate for you um, during tick season, which again, we talked about, you know, whenever it's warm enough for the ticks to be out. Um, and you can stop and start it. That's fine. Um, if you're you know, farming at a certain time of year, you're only working outdoors or um, highly recreational for a week, you go on this trip and you want to take it during that week, you know, you can, you can do it like that. If I'm considering starting something for prophylaxis, would that generally be herbal? Or is there a place for antibiotics in a prophylactic strategy before I know whether the tick had anything before I have any symptoms? I don't use antibiotics as pure prophylaxis. Um, if we, if somebody develops symptoms, then we're in a whole nother camp. And then we talk about that. I do use antibiotics early on in treatment. Um, but for prophylaxis, I, I stick to the herbal um, regimen, which I must say, you know, these, these herbs are, um, first of all, getting to the round form of Lyme, which um, say doxycycline, like the one or two dose doxycycline does not get to that round form. Um, and to the, um, the biofilm to some degree. I also add a biofilm buster on to that as well sometimes, and especially if there are symptoms. Um, and then it gets to all these different pathogens, but then it's also helping your immune system work better. So in the face of Lyme, uh, antibiotics, as far as we know, are not helping uh, immune modulation uh, like, say, knotweed, Japanese knotweed, um, or cat's claw. Um, you know, and they do for, for concern over neurological symptoms, um, andrographis and knotweed, these are herbs that um, can go through the blood brain barrier. Um, so, I mean, it's just, there's so many different properties of herbs, which is so wonderful because they do more than one thing. They're not just engineered to kill this one bacteria in a certain way. So I think that's really helpful to have all of those strategies on board early on um, whether you're, you're symptomatic or not. Um, yeah, hundred percent agree. I think herbs are amazing and have a, a fantastic potential here to really save, uh, lots of suffering and misery later after an exposure to a, a vector borne pathogen. Um, after a tick bite, would we generally be thinking of only oral interventions or are there any topical tools that one might use at the actual site of the tick exposure? Yeah, I recommend andrographis um, to the tick bite wound. Um, you know, that is specific to killing Lyme. So um, you could also use the tick bite formula that's appropriate to the tick bite um, and just put two drops right on the wound. Um, I've had good feedback talking about people feeling like they've been healing better, which is interesting, you know, an aside to the actual infection piece. Um, because some people, you know, find that bites are itchy or um, they hurt or they take a while to heal. Um, and sometimes people have reported that, you know, I tend to get tick bites that then itch me. And when I put the andrographis on, it healed up and I actually didn't have that itchiness. And I don't think we know why some people have the itching or the extra inflammation just locally around a tick bite um, compared to other people but it's seemed to help in that way. And I mean, the point of putting that on is more so about how when a tick attaches, it can um, release feces onto the skin. So if you have a tick, and in that feces, P. 
can be these tick-borne diseases. So if you have a bite and then you remove the tick and it's itchy and then you bring in the feces, there could be another exposure to the tick-borne disease. Lovely image, I know. <laughs> it's <laughs> but, interesting, yeah. You know, for sure. <laughs> but if you, so I always think about, you know, quick removal, quick gentle removal with the O-time twister and then put the andrographis right on, don't touch it, um, you know, don't scratch it, that sort of thing. Do you find that those people that have that exacerbated itching type response, are they also then the patients that are more likely to have mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance, or have you not necessarily seen a correlation? Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't noticed that. One of the things that you also use in your uh, prophylaxis approach are homeopathic remedies. And so as a naturopath in the work that you do, I love naturopaths. I mean, I think that everyone with a tick-borne infection should have a naturopath on their team because we need to look really holistically. And so talk to us a little bit, what are the homeopathics like Leadum and Apis doing in these prophylactic protocols? Yeah, so the next step after putting the andrographis on, um, you could take Leadum for a tick bite. Um, and so homeopathy is, is a, an entire branch of medicine unto itself. That's fascinating. But, um, you know, basically it's this energetic medicine. Uh, the leadum can help basically um, in an energetic way, also in, in a way to help the immune system deal with this tick bite. Um, so it would be three pellets under your tongue three times a day for three days. And then apis, um, basically the profile of when to use apis in that world would be for something that's swollen and red and hot and that sort of thing. So if you did get a, a Lyme rash, a bullseye rash or otherwise, that's, you know, red or swollen, hot to touch, or if it's really just locally, even if the, the bite itself, you if you are somebody who feels like there's a lot of itching, sometimes that comes with this redness and the burning or heat, um, that would be a sign that apis would be helpful. And you can do both of them together, three pellets, three times a day for three days. In the book, you talk about so many different herbal formulations like the deer tick bite formula, the American dog tick bite formula, the Lone Star tick bite formula. I mean, on and on, there's a whole list of these things that have been put together. So talk to us a little about some of the herbs that are potentially helpful for people that are dealing with tick-borne infections that are in these formulas? How might they target specific pathogens that are observed in various types of ticks? And then are these formulas something that people can purchase pre-made or do they have to make them themselves? Um, yeah. So I first started uh, with, well, I just called it tick bite formula. Um, several years ago with patients who were getting tick bites. And I was thinking about this idea of prophylaxis and being proactive. I certainly would be. Um, and some people may or may not choose to be, and that's okay. But if people wanted to be to, you know, start doing that. And, um, and we have tick bite clinics at the at Sojourns Community Health Clinic where I work in Vermont and um, became really passionate about really bringing attention to the acute illness, you know, and the tick bite um, versus most of my time being spent with those with chronic illness. So trying to really make time in the schedule to also see during, you know, tick season, which we see more, you know, all the time, but um, certainly more during the warmer weather, um, you know, starting around this time um, so that we can really get to that infection early so that we can prevent the chronic illness later. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I work with a uh, herbalist, um, Bonnie Bloom, who's wonderful. Um, she's got so much knowledge and passion for treating Lyme as well. Um, so I, you know, through research, a lot of Stephen Buhner <laughs> reading and other, um, information that I picked out the specific, um, and also thinking about side effects and making it as safe as possible, all these different, um, components, you know, to, to come up with this formula. So, um, so basically, you know, thinking about, it's interesting, cryptolepis, there was a study showing that that um, is used, so cryptolepis treats malaria. There's a lot of research on that. And then there's even this study showing about, showing that it um, is used in prophylaxis. So people who are on cryptolepis, this herb um, from Africa, um, they would be less likely to get malaria. So it was actually used in that way. So I thought, well, this is, this is great. Um, 
having that after I've already been using with people. Um, so I'm kind of applying that idea, you know, the, the idea of prophylaxis, um, but using herbs. Um, and so cryptolip is more recently, there's a, a, an article out, which is amazing, that um, it actually treats Lyme. So I usually use it in Babesia treatment, um, malaria-like tick-borne disease. So um, it's also showing that it, it kills Lyme, which is great. Um, so that's it. I think that's a real powerful piece probably of this deer tick bite formula. Um, and then there's uh, knotweed, which I mentioned earlier. So it crosses the blood brain barrier, uh, has a lot of immune modulation. Um, I use it a lot as a support to people, not just thinking about that antimicrobial piece, but also just how supportive it is for the neurological system, for, for joints, for um, endothelial cells. Um, you know, all these different pieces, Japanese knotweed is, is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so that, so that, so we started with deer tick bite formula. And then, um, as I was writing this book, I was thinking, well, I, I definitely want to give other people in other areas with different ticks, the ability to do the same thing. So, um, started, you know, drawing up these different, um, formulas so that would be applicable per tick. Um, so can yeah. people get those directly from Bonnie or do they have to get them through a healthcare provider? Um, they can get it through Bonnie Bloom, who's at Blue Crow Botanicals in Massachusetts. Um, they could get it from Sojourns Community Health Clinic um, or they can buy like in the book I, I, in the back. There, there are different um, companies like Woodland Essence, Herbie's Herbs. Um, there are these different companies that you can buy, you know, one tincture from and then make your own. Or you could also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, less, less easy. And then you can also buy the raw material, right? If you really wanted, you know, some homework. Um, and so I include um, with gratitude to Bonnie Bloom, um, her process in making the medicine. Um, and, and really it, it's not just a generic kind of, uh, medicine making approach. It's very particular to how each of these herbs needs to be treated and what constituents we're looking for. And so it's not that easy, you know, <laughs> really getting into the details with her um, for even more gratitude uh, for all the hard work that it takes to make these formulas. Um, so if you're, if you're an herbalist already, or if you're into learning something new like this, you can totally do it yourself. And so there are instructions how to do that. But um, it might be hard <laughs> for a lot of us. If we look at something like the deer tick bite formula, it makes a lot of sense that if you just had an exposure, um, that that's very broad in its coverage. Let's say someone has had chronic Lyme disease for, you know, 15 or 20 years. Would you necessarily then use something like the deer tick bite formula or would you use things that were more specific to Bartonella or Anaplasma, for example, and unlayer things? In other words, would people with chronic microbial burdens be able to tolerate these broad spectrum formulas? Yeah, with a chronically ill patient that I am treating for tick-borne disease already, we may not need to even do deer tick bite formula. Um, you know, so I, I, I would look at what they're taking. Uh, and maybe we would add something like, yes, if they're not being treated for anaplasma, we'll have that conversation. So you had this tick bite, you tested it, it was positive for anaplasma we could then do a one month prophylaxis with anaplasma formula, <laughs> which has a host of herbs in it for anaplasma. So that would be an option. Um, but if they're already being treated for Lyme, you know, we may, we may do just, you know, a boost in that treatment, or we may just leave it alone and see and watch and wait if anything comes new from, from the bite. Um, but I've, I've also had plenty of people, um, you know, want to want to do that extra. No, let's just do deer tick bite formula. I got a tick. I didn't save it. You know, I definitely want to do everything I can right now. And they perks, right? Because we're, we're adding treatment. So if they already had Lyme or Babesia or um, Bartonella, you know, not weed treats Bartonellosis. So um, they might have a herx on that. And so we know that, you know, we have this conversation, we know what to expect, and we might have to pull back if it's just too much for them. 
So let's say we had a tick bite, we've started the herbal prophylaxis program. What do we then watch for to determine when a doctor should be contacted and things might have gone beyond this prophylaxis and potentially into the need for personalized treatment or therapeutic interventions? Right. So I think once symptoms come, I mean, if, if somebody does not have a practitioner on board at all, um, you know, I, I would encourage you to reach out to a Lyme literate practitioner, if possible, um, you know, or at least your primary care practitioner or somebody um, in the medical field, um, if you start developing symptoms after a tick bite. So let's say I do develop some symptoms. How does the uh, treatment then shift from prophylaxis to more of an acute treatment strategy? Are there different things then that you're considering in that acute treatment strategy phase? Right. So then I want to try and get as clear as we can about the symptoms. Um, I want to evaluate whether or not we need to do some testing, you know, which depends on how long after the bite it is. Um, you know, like say, say with anaplasma again. (laughs) <laughs> it's often pretty straightforward. You know, there's a PCR test that you can take in the first week of anaplasmosis, and it's it's pretty accurate. Um, and after that, you can do antibodies testing. But between their, their acute symptoms, you know, if it's like high fever and headaches, and yes, it can also be the joint and muscle pain, flu-like symptoms, um, then that's, that's a little more anaplasmosis. Um, and so we can talk about testing and then Lyme, you know, of course we wouldn't test until three or four weeks later. So if they're already sick, you know, it's all about trying to see with this individual, like, where are you on this journey? Do you have symptoms? Does it make sense to test? Is it too early? All of that. So, so we would think about that. And um, you know, if we had a positive or if we had a a, a Lyme rash, um, then we know it's Lyme or if we had a positive anaplasma or something like that, then we would definitely talk about incorporating antibiotics at that point um, and making sure there's a biofilm buster as well. So then in terms of testing, um, what are some of the tests that you find most helpful in your clinical practice? Are you generally looking at direct tests or indirect tests? And then uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more around how much time after the bite do we potentially need to wait for certain tests to be even valid? So, you know, could I run any of these tests, you know, a week later, or do you need time for the immune system to create antibodies for an indirect test to potentially show a positive result? Right. So with Lyme, you need three to four weeks. Um, Anaplasma, the PCR is fine in the first week. And then after that, it would be um, antibodies, IFA, um, IgG, IgM. Um, And so so looking at at different companies for um, the Borrelia burgdorferi, you know, would be the most common discussion that I would have Um, for anaplasmosis or lichiosis. Rickettsia, the regular labs are just fine with accuracy. Um, but it's more about the Lyme disease or um, tick borne relapsing fever, where I look at using a lab like Igenex for better accuracy. Um, and how about so, Bartonella and Babesia? Yeah, and, and, and the same. Yes, I, I like to use uh, Igenex, the fish technology, the fluorescent in situ hybridization. Um, which tags RNA. Um, and so basically for Babesia and Bartonella, if we use the fish technology, we can find out whether somebody has a current active um, infection. So that's also really helpful anyway, whether somebody's acute or, or chronic. Um, you know, Lyme disease is a little trickier, but uh, the immunoblot has been really helpful. The book doesn't really go into a lot of the chronic Lyme treatment strategies. It's focused on prophylaxis and acute treatment and ticks and prevention. I mean, that's the the title of the book is really focused on prevention, which is fantastic. But you as a top clinician in this realm, I'm interested when you're in the chronic Lyme realm and someone's dealt with this for 15 or 20 years, what are some of the top interventions right now that really excite you as a practitioner? Um, well, I use a lot of herbal medicine and as a naturopath, I look holistically at people. So I'm always, I'm always looking at, well, what else could be going on? What are we missing? You know, mold illness is huge. 
mast cell, like you mentioned before. Um, I mean, even just, do you have a thyroid, the low thyroid function? Or, you know, there are so many pieces looking at the whole person, making sure we're not missing anything. You know, are you sleeping? How is your stress? How are your relationships? Um, looking at diet, there, there are all these different pieces that are so important. Um, for treatments, um, we, we're a nonprofit clinic. I don't, I don't do anything too, uh, you know, uh, fancy or, or, you know, we don't have the means to do a lot of expensive treatments. So um, I don't have a lot of experience beyond oral treatments except for uh, hyperbaric oxygen, which I've seen great things with. So awesome. also, um, yeah, yeah, I've had people do really well with hyperbaric. And now I'm using disulfiram, although uh, it's been uh, hard to get. <laughs> so I've had to pause a little bit on getting new people onto it, but I've seen really great things. Um, so um, that's been great. Yeah, it's exciting um, having myself observed the Lyme realm now for 15 years. Um, it, it's really the first time that it feels very hopeful that we have, you know, new tools and strategies like disulfiram that are really making a difference. I mean, not that people didn't get well um, in the past, but that that there was some degree of managing chronic Lyme longer term and that maybe we didn't actually eradicate it completely. But with disulfiram, um, it sounds like that's potentially different, that people do have these very long-term remissions. And so I think it's a, for people that are um, just finding out that they maybe have chronic Lyme disease, I think it's a, a very hopeful time in um, the, the timeline of Lyme disease to, to be hopeful about having the real possibility of getting well. Yeah, it's exciting. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you recommend people go to find practitioners that treat Lyme disease in a similar manner to what you do, whether we're really skilled in treating Lyme disease? ILADS is a wonderful resource. So ILADS.org. Um, there's also the Global Lyme Alliance. Um, and LymeDisease.org as well. So uh, those are three great resources where you could um, just ask for a referral of a person in your area or a list of practitioners in your area um, to link you to um, Lyme literate practitioners. And I know you're you're also um, involved with ICI or the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, which lots of the practitioners there also are familiar with Lyme, but to your point, also really exploring the potential for mold illness and the environmental aspect of all of this. So um, I think ICI.org, um, I-S-E-A-I.org, there's also a list of practitioners there that uh, could potentially be helpful for people. I really want to urge people to get this book as a resource so that you have it on hand when you need it. Um, There's just so much good information in the book. Um, We couldn't even begin to cover it in this conversation. Um, Yeah, fantastic. Um, Tell us how people can find the book and any other resources that you want to share that might be helpful for them. Yeah, so you can get the book at your local bookseller, um, your library, you can go online to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or uh, indie booksellers. Um, so it's, it's readily available if you ask. Um, you can also, if you'd like a signed copy, you can go to my website, dralexischesney.com, click on book, and then uh, there'll be a link that if you so desire, you could purchase a book that is signed. Um, Sojourns Community Health Clinic is also uh, carrying the book. And if you would like to carry the book, you can contact the publisher, which is story publishing, um, so that, you know, in, in your office or in your community space, if, if you wanted to do that, um, you could. And if for some reason you didn't get the book and you got a tick bite and then you need the book, you can go on to Amazon and buy the Kindle edition and have it uh, available in just a couple of minutes, which is what I did. So, um, yeah, it's really a great <laughs> resource. Right. The uh, last question that I ask is the same for every guest, and that's what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Mm. Well, my new addition is I just got this little mini trampoline because of all the telemedicine I'm doing. The first week of that, I realized I was not moving much at all. (laughs) So in between visits, uh, most of the time, if I have even 30 seconds, I'll just... um, beyond that, which has really improved, I think, my circulation and my mood. 
uh, my focus. So that's been awesome this, this past week. Um, but other things that I do, exercise is really important to me. I happen to enjoy it and um, I'm glad for that. Um, also just you know, spiritual health is really important to me. Um, so I, I have a meditation practice. I do yoga every morning. Um, so it gives me a little of that exercise, but also that uh, grounding I need um, in myself in order to then hold space for other people. Um, and, um, you know, I, I take a list of supplements, of course. <laughs> um, reading this great book, The Energy Code, um, really fascinating, Sue Mortar. So that's, um, you know, a little bit of intellectual interest, but also self, uh, self care. So beautiful. Yeah. This has been a really fun conversation. Again, I'm really excited about the book. I do hope people will go out and get it. There's just so much good information in it. Um, and looking at things from a slightly different perspective that I've seen them before with the maps and charts and all of that. I mean, it's just a fantastic resource. Um, it's obvious to me from our conversation that you have a lot of passion for really helping your patients and minimizing their struggle and giving them resources. And so I just want to thank you and honor you. And um, I appreciate you taking the time to share with all of us today. So thank you, Dr. Chesney. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your work. To learn more about today's guest, visit DrAlexisChesney.com. That's Dr. D-R Alexis, A-L-E-X-I-S, Chesney, C-H-E-S-N-E-Y.com. DrAlexisChesney.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit BetterHealthGuy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.